Welcome to another My Two Cents video for Microsoft Flight Simulator. What does it really take to run this sim? Thank you so much everyone for joining me today. And in today's video, we're gonna take out this gorgeously rendered, this amazing aircraft the DA-62 and we're going to fly it from one of the airports I did my flight training in as a youth and that's going to be Farmingdale on Long Island and we're going to fly in no set pattern we're not going to be on a flight pan plan per se today my idea here is to see with high-end mode activated and the slider for I, I guess you would call it terrain detail slid up to 140. What is the experience like when you're flying in a highly congested area? So Long Island does not qualify as a highly congested area. It's congested, there's a lot of scenery, but it's not highly congested. But we're gonna fly east to JFK, north to LaGuardia, east to the East River, and fly south along, you know, just over the East River, looking at New York, flying around the Battery, looking at the Freedom Tower, and then turning north. So we're gonna fly south down the East River, and then turn kind of like a 180, but following the Battery, up north, follow the Hudson until we're perpendicular to Westchester Airport, then we're gonna turn in and land there. I need to know what this is actually going to be like. It's very important because I'm telling people to buy this game, and I still will. And after this flight, I still am. I still know people that fly on low and medium detail settings in X-Plane and in the older flight sims because they just don't have the hardware to push it. So when you're a flight sim enthusiast but don't have the money to get a high-end system, you really want to know, how does it run for me? But for those people that are just on the edge of being all out nuts about spending money on a computer, which I consider the nuts part not to be nuts, but to be people that are more fortunate than me. So I'm looking at people that have 2080 Ti's, Titans, I'm looking at people that have 3950's, Threadrippers, 10900's, uh, i9's, you know, the, the, the equipment that I did not choose to afford. So. I tell people what my makeup of my computer is all the time when they start watching the video, so we're going to do it here right now. It's a Ryzen 7 3700X. It's being slightly overclocked by Ryzen Master. I'm letting Ryzen Master do it automatically. I have a Power Color Red Devil 5700 XT, and that has 8 gigabytes of RAM on board. I have a 960 Pro, I keep saying 970, but it's a Samsung 960 Pro NVMe hard drive. And then the game is installed in two places. So the actual game files are on a hybrid drive made by Seagate, it's called a Fire Cuda. But all the scenery seems to be cached on the NVMe, which I think is pretty awesome. So I'm utilizing both. Right now that C drive is for my operating system, and that C drive is actually for Star Citizen, okay? I'm going to have to update this in the future, and I've been looking at some really nice and fast, very, very large 2.5-inch SSDs, but I'm thinking that the second slot of NVMe drives in my computer might need to be upgraded to something that has a lot more space. Gonna have to figure that out later. RAM wise, it's PC3600, so it's faster RAM made by Corsair. It's the Vengeance Pro, not the Dominator. And I think that's all that really matters. I have a really heavy duty Corsair cooler in there. And that's it, right? The motherboard isn't a high end one, it's the Tough Gaming X570 board. So I'm right on that edge of high-end enthusiasts. I, I haven't crossed the line into the 3800, the 3900, the 3950. I stopped at the 3700 because I feel it works here. So I'm enjoying the game and I'm finding the performance for me in most places to be absolutely acceptable and out of this world. 
um, amazing for the type of scenery that we're seeing. Now, in retrospect, if I load up a bunch of ortho photos, run uh, SkyMax Pro, I think it's called, which gives me the lighting effects that you kind of see here. It makes the sky look gorgeous. I'm getting somewhere between 47 and 60 frames per second on X-Plane. X-Plane has the beautifully rendered PBR aircraft. And my satellite detail from the Ortho 4XP, I actually move it up uh, quite a bit. I'm using... I'm trying to think. I, I, I've got a lot of the airports in 18 and 19, or whatever the, high, like the higher end numbers are when you set that up. And the areas out to 10 miles around it are one level down. And areas that are um, a little bit further are one level down. And then I have the majority of the space, I think, at 16. So that means that when I'm flying at 3,500 to 5,500 to 6,500 feet in VFR, in a slow mover, like one of these, or like a Cessna that I like to fly all the time, I have picture-perfect and beautiful scenery to fly over that makes me feel like I'm flying in the real world with SkyMax Pro. It doesn't come close to what Microsoft Flight Sim... Well, it does. It comes close, but Microsoft Flight Sim still runs away with the prize here. But I'm going from 50 frames per second down to 28 to 30. And... I'm calling it acceptable because I've been a flight simmer all my life, and I'm going to say this. Those frame rates are acceptable, especially when they're just at 30 or more, and they're consistent and not dropping below that 30 level. So when I say 27 is acceptable, it would be if it drops there for a little bit. Now, in today's flight, I do have a couple of pet peeves, and one of them is the way that ATC chooses runways at the airport. And I, I really do want to say this. If you look at the windsock, which we're passing right now, we've got a crosswind over here. It's, the wind is actually blowing right down runway one at Farmingdale. But I believe since this is the, aisle, you know, the instrument landing runway where you would go in for instrument approaches, that this is the runway that was open for that. So when Microsoft's uh, program goes out to check which runway should be active, I think they're pulling from that data and not using the, oh, if it's a GA aircraft, they're going to be taken off on one, and they don't need to do precision approaches or departures or whatever. So that's one pet peeve. The other two pet peeves have to do with ground vehicles and the ground control, all right? So I don't need to be pushed back as a GA aircraft. Now, it might be the ramps I'm choosing, it might be the airports I'm flying from, I don't know. But every time I fly, I've got this guy sitting right in front of my prop, and if I turn it on, I'm going to cut him in half. And then, as I'm taxiing, I see more vehicles in one taxi from ramp to the runway on the taxiway than I have in my 20 plus years of flying. Well, it's actually 30 plus, but we're gonna, almost 30 plus, we're, we're, we're gonna leave it right there. So it's just those things could be fit. But they're pet peeve, right? Pet peeves. They are not things that are gonna detract from the game. They're not things gonna make, that are gonna make you say, oh, this game is poop. It's actually absolutely the opposite. I have now fallen in love with Microsoft's flight model for a Microsoft sim, and I have to say this, they deserve kudos because the stock aircraft were not very good in Microsoft Flight Sim. They were getting better in Flight Sim World. And the Just Flight aircraft that was in Flight Sim World was actually absolutely amazing. But here... I'm finding that the flight model is definitely almost at the fidelity of X-Plane. X-Plane still edges it out in some ways, but I, I'd have to say that's because I fly that Airfoil Labs, the Snow 172 in that game, and that is as realistic as it can be for me. And right now, we were running right around 37 FPS. We're still over Long Island, still over the smaller buildings still over the less densely populated area, 
And you can tell, you can tell that this is aerial and satellite photos because of the way that they're striped on the ground. But somehow, in most places, Microsoft finds a way to blend that away. In tomorrow's video, when we're flying up in Alaska on my backup system, you're going to see those stripes start to come out. And it's, it's as immersion breaking as it is inside of X-Plane when I'm flying over my ortho photos and I see clouds on the deck. Here, we never see that and I'm very happy about that. I think it's amazing how Microsoft has been able to use all this data from satellite and aerial imaging and they've been able to get those things, those anomalies out like aircraft on the ground sometimes. I still see it somewhere. And also like cloud. So here we are getting closer and closer to JFK, which is just in, just in front of us. I'm going to fly a lot of this from the outside so you can see the scenery. We're still in the high to mid 30s, so mid to high 30s. You can see things start to change in just a few minutes. There's actually a line where you start to see the smaller buildings, the suburban communities of Nassau County start to disappear and those more congested areas where people live, so residential areas in Queens and Brooklyn. And when that starts to hit, I drop to 34 frames per second. So 34 p FPS is absolutely playable in a flight sim. And people usually say, well, why do flight sims get such bad frame rate? In Star Citizen, which is one of the games I play the most, they use something called level of detail that diminishes the detail level the further you are away from something. So whether it be a planet, a ship, a space station, etc., that level of detail is made very basic. It also doesn't have to render everything in a world unless you're flying around a world. And that level of detail is still brought down to a minimum so you can get those great frame rates that you get in a game like that. But in a flight sim, everything is rendered out at infinity. So you're rendering every building, every landmark, every bridge, you know, everything, every mountain. And then as you get lower, you're rendering every tree. And that's because it's important that you see these things from as far away as possible, that you can make out the detail from as far away as possible. So a flight sim is always going to have that handicap. You're always going to have a frame rate limitation based upon having to render detail at much greater distances. Now that is something you could turn down. That's something that you can you, you, you can use as a crutch to make it run faster on your system. But what happens then is kind of like what's happening as I'm flying over this area for the first time and Microsoft is streaming this the, the scenery to my computer, which will then be cached there, I hope. So you get this area of visual acuity loss at a distance. And as you get closer, it starts to come into focus. I've found that I've been flying around Atlanta for a while. I had that with the first one or two flights. But ever since then, I guess enough data has been cached on my system that that doesn't happen anymore. And I have noticed that folder where Microsoft caches the scenery data has been getting bigger and bigger. It's now well over 300 gigabytes. I'm gonna need a bigger drive at some point. So here's JFK, it is a handcrafted airport. So most everything is going to be rendered in amazingly well. Some of the buildings are gonna have LOD on it, level of detail, so they get more detailed the closer you get but their actual shapes and sizes and approximate location is exact. As we get over Kennedy, something strange starts to happen. I get locked at 30 frames per second. I'm not going up, I'm not going down, I'm not stuttering, I'm not slowing. It's just 30 frames. I don't understand why that happened. 
Maybe it's part of the sim to make sure you don't lose that detail level when you get close to an airport so you could lock it to give it a smoother feel. But then I get a little bit of stutters and those stutters are the detail popping in on all of those different buildings down below. Now that I'm reducing my altitude and trying to get a look at it. So we move away from Kennedy and we move in towards New York City. New York City is not a handcrafted city. We can tell right away. And the way that you can tell that is the buildings, the scenery, and all it, it all seems to have these anomalies, like the bridges. All the bridges are rendered from satellite imaging. So what happens, or aerial imaging, and what happens is that the shadows the bridge cast are rendered as solid objects. So the bridge seems solid all the way down to the water. It kind of pulls you away from it when you see some of these bridges. Other bridges, like what we see up ahead, don't seem to have that same look and feel until we get closer. We are now at 24 to 27 frames per second when we look to the west. And that's just something that we're going to be at to fly over this wonderful scenery. I'm kind of conflicted here. Because I considered myself having a decent computer. But at this point, in order to run this at an enjoyable frame rate, I would have to spend almost another third to get a faster processor to get a faster graphic card and possibly even faster RAM. So I started looking at my graphic card at this point and trying to see what was going on. My eight core CPU was not pegged. It was at like 40 to 48%. Don't understand that at all until I read that the maximum cores that you're rendering on right now, because the game is released with DirectX 11 support instead of 12 support, is four. So it's only using four of my eight cores on my amazingly fast processor. But the other thing that got me worried, besides how hot my graphic card was running, so these look like handcrafted um, bridges down below. But the other thing, besides how hot it was running, was the fact that 97 percent to a hundred percent of my graphic RAM was being used. All the VRAM on my 2080, all eight gigabytes, was soaked. It was soaked up. It was filled. And what that means is I have to wait and see what NVIDIA, AMD, and Intel, yes I said Intel because their graphic card is coming out soon, release. And I have to hope and pray and maybe demand that, oh my god, that scenery is so beautiful, that their new graphic card have a minimum of 16 gigs. I mean, I would say minimum of 12 gig, but minimum of 16 gigs for me to run this game the way I want to. Look at the reflections of the buildings on the water. It's just amazing. Now, I know my settings are kind of not ultra, but everything over here seems to be rendering in beautifully. I'm back up to 30 frames. I'm flying over New York Harbor, going over towards Liberty Island. There's a jetliner really low below us. I think we're at like 2,500 or 3,500 feet. It took me only a few seconds to realize that that airliner was actually flying into Newark. But as I look at Ellis Island over here, a national landmark for immigration in, in the U.S., it did not have that fidelity I expected to. Such an important landmark, and it didn't have it from this altitude. It's kind of blurry. And I'm wondering if that's my settings, and as I upgrade my system over the next few years, if that will actually come in a little bit better. Or maybe when Orbex or somebody comes in and does a handcrafted model of New York City. If someone comes back and tells me that the city is handcrafted, I'm going to lose it because... Although the buildings and everything over here look great, the bridges and some other anomalies like textures that are just inconsistent or trees growing out of boats and growing out of buildings, just it, it just ruined that 
immersion for me. And while this is the best looking New York City I've ever flown over in a flight sim, it just pains me that there's so many people out there that won't even see it at my level because I have an expensive computer thanks to my patrons, thanks to people that watch me on Twitch. I think this is the shape, the look of things to come. And as our systems start getting better and better over the next five years, I think my computer is going to start becoming the low end. And when it does, people are going to be able to experience this. But out of the gate, those streamers, those YouTubers that you're watching with the amazing scenery, I've seen some of them, my favorite squirrel, he's got a beast of a system that's at least a thousand dollars or more expensive than mine. He's got 2080 Ti's and a 3950 and those two alone are double the cost of the card and the processor I have in my computer. And let's not talk about the RAM, the hard drives, or the motherboard that he uses because they all double the cost of mine too. So it's very possible that his system is close to double the price of mine, but he deserves it. One of my favorite, favorite YouTubers out there when it comes to simulations, whether it be truck simulator or flight simulator and X-Plane. He's amazing. But still, I feel bad for those people that aren't going to get this fidelity. But I feel amazingly fortunate that this exists because this pushes us forward. And as we move towards the implementation of something like DirectX 12 as the rendering engine for this game, we should be able to see a performance increase. And different things that could be rendered. Who knows, maybe at some point, ray tracing will be part of this game. I think it will be, by the way, because I think if Microsoft has put it into something like Minecraft, they're going to find a way to put it somewhere in this game eventually. Now, I say this every episode, and I'm going to say it right now. All I want you to think of is that new reverb that HP is coming out with and VR. This game in VR is going to be the most immersive flight sim ever, and I'm wondering if the technology is going to be such that the military and commercial aviation will start looking at it as a way to train pilot. I mean, not even flying. What about just looking around the cockpit and going through procedures for starting an aircraft and for doing emergency procedures for takeoffs and landings and IFR? This might be that product that pushes that. Now, I know we do that in X-Plane. I fly VR in X-Plane. Makes me nauseous at first. Once I get used to it, it's pretty awesome. But right now on my Rift desk, the gauges are blurry. The frame rate is a little bit low. The refresh rate is not where I want it to be. But that second gen HP Reverb really has me interested. And I can't wait until I'm actually able to get one and then start using it in this game, hopefully after the 27th of August or whatever the patch is after that day. But let's be serious. The minute the VR patch comes out, I'm going to be in this game with it and my Rift S just to see how amazing it's going to be. I don't expect much, but I have a feeling I'm going to be pleasantly surprised. Because we're actually using terrain detail from satellite and aerial imaging, some of the AI created 3D objects kind of just don't make it into the game right. The Tappan Zee Bridge, which is what we were just looking at, seemed to be half underwater. Now, I, I remember Austin Meyer a few months back saying, hey, um, are people really going to enjoy flying over satellite detail if it's broken, if it breaks immersion, if it doesn't look good, if it's not truly consistent everywhere you fly and very eh, in some areas and very nice in other areas. I'm going to say this. I, I don't mind it. I, if I could fly over some areas that are amazingly beautiful, I'll deal with the glitches. But I'm hoping somewhere down the line, Microsoft is able to improve the AI that builds those objects and make things just a little bit better. 
or they have a board where you can take pictures of things, screenshots, and post them and put them up there and they can put it into a queue and work on them over time. I'm hoping that happens because I think the game is amazing and if they could have the community involvement that you have in X-Plane where community members actually make scenery for airports and make scenery for different cities, make aircraft that are actually amazing at times. There's some community aircraft that have higher fidelity than the ones that come with the game or that you purchase. So I'm hoping that that becomes a way that Microsoft goes with Flight Sim. But I have a feeling because there's a marketplace, because they sell Microsoft points on the Steam store instead of you selling you the actual planes, that that might not be the case. I, I, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm hoping it is, but I don't know. I have a lot to do with research. I have a lot to do with finding out where my place is in this sim. Right now, it's just flying around and gawking at the scenery and being pleasantly surprised by the flight model of all the different aircraft. I think they've nailed it. I think the game is great. You're going to see a lot of videos on this game from me. And tomorrow, tomorrow you'll actually see a video from me that was shot on my backup system. You see, I have two systems. One I call Darth Vader, the other one Stormtrooper because it's all white and beautiful. On that system, I have an R5-3600, not overclocked because the motherboard I'm using is the only MATX board that was available at the time for the Corsair Crystal 280 case, which is a micro ATX tower. And that's an ASRock 570 Pro. It's not a great board. It overheats and the fan starts to make lots of noise. The, I guess it's the chip fan or whether, whatever they call it. So I also have a 5700 XT in there. And I think you'll enjoy that video because what you find out is for a system that costs 800 to $1,000 less than the one I built here, I'm only losing five frames. Five frames, that's all I'm losing. So we're on a straight in approach to Westchester County. We're going to land, we're going to put away this aircraft, and we're going to bid you adieu. I am going to be bringing you that flight tomorrow, flying in Alaska. And then I have another one that I did last night. Not going to tell you where I flew, but it was very amazing. And it was very fun. And we're going to bring that one to you tomorrow. Well, probably two days from now. All right, so we're not in a straight-in approach. What I found was that we are in a... We're entering a left downwind for the other runway. So we're going to try to make this a decent landing, but I'm saying this. First few flights that we're making here are all about looking at the scenery, seeing the performance, seeing the differences in this sim from others. That view out the window is just amazing and trying to wrap our brain around where I want to take my channel with these videos on X-Plane. If any of you know if there's a plugin for something like FS Economy or something similar, please tell me. If any of you know that there's a plugin so it could send data to Garmin Pilot or ForeFlight, please let me know. I would love to incorporate those two into videos in the future. I'm waiting for the big patch on the 27th. Right now, I don't know what's in that patch, but I'm sure it's going to fix some of the bugs and it's going to add some other features. At some point, I'm going to go over the UI in the game and talk about how, for a flight sim enthusiast, it kind of breaks things, but I'm starting to like the UI a little bit more. But it seems to be made more for the Xbox community than for the computer community. And as we turn on to final, which is the worst pattern I've ever flown, well, it's a combination of many bad patterns. We are way too low right now. I swear this is like a carrier landing turning in towards the deck, and I'm still not lined up correctly. But I do touch this baby down rather nicely because, believe it or not, the DA62 I own from Arabesque, ever slightly better in many ways, especially the flight model, but not by much, not by much. So I know how to fly this aircraft, and I'm able to squeak the landing. 
If you like this video, please click the thumbs up button. If you are a subscriber or do subscribe, please click that bell shaped notification icon so you're notified of all my future videos. There's a Patreon over at patreon.com forward slash Batgirl where you can become a supporter of the site and help me do things like get many of the sceneries and aircraft for flight sim so I can test them out and see how they work. And in the future, you, you're going to hear me not be critical, but be realistic about this sim. I don't want to be the one gushing all over it all the time. I want to be realistic, talk about the things that are amazing, and talk about the things that need work. Because the videos I've been watching seem to all be talking about how amazing it is. And it is, because of the scenery. But there's still some things that need work, and I think when they're done, this is going to be the end-all be-all for flight simulators unless Austin Myers and his group shock us over the next year, which I have a feeling they're going to. And then we'll have two great sims that will keep pushing each other forward all the time. With that said, folks, you all be safe out there, and I will talk to you soon.